Hello, friends. It's Pastor Benjamin Faircloth. I want to welcome you to Prophetic Worldview. I'm so excited about my guests that I'm going to bring on here in just a minute. Uh, I just This is our first time we've ever uh, interviewed each other or talked to each other, and I'm really excited about the fellowship and this opportunity. I want to uh, introduce to you uh, Jamie Weldon. Actually, doesn't even need an introduction. Uh, God's been using him all over the place, and uh, he's an author of the book Omega Dynamics and also the greatest part I love about him, he's a father. That's right. He's a daddy, just like me. And so we're, we're glad about that. He's also uh, a former, uh, well, you're not former. You're never a former Marine. That's right. Good, ca- good catch, yeah. Pastor Faircloth. <laughs> I've, lear- I've learned that over the years, uh, being a, an Army guy. But I always got corrected. But uh, we're just thankful for his service to the country. And most of all, I'm thankful for his service to the kingdom of God. Uh, guys, I want to welcome you, Jamie Weldon. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Pastor Faircloth. It's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I've been um, just increasingly becoming familiar with you and the the Lord's just touch on your heart and the burden for your heart through our mutual friend, Steve Quayle. And, and uh, you know, to, to see some of the different things that he share and follow you online. And it's just an honor to be with you and talking about the Lord in this late hour, as we were kind of mentioning off air for the listeners is... Uh, you know, I, I love I love getting on the air with men of God, because like we always say, we we don't have to do anything. There's no prep work. It's by the unity with the spirit of God through his son, Jesus Christ, that we're able to even talk about different things. And like I say, with all simplicity, it's like, hey, bro, we're just going to fellowship on the air and we'll see what the Lord wants to do. So that's what we do is we're just fellowshipping and it happens to be recorded. These are the same conversations that if you come hang out of the house or hang out with our men's group or whatever, the same conversations going on all the time. And just every once in a while, by God's grace, we're able to record it. And uh, and again, by his his abundant, exceedingly abundant grace that pours out to us. Uh, hopefully those with ears to hear are hearing what the spirit is saying to the church in this late hour. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate your voice that's out there right now. That's making that call and that cry, if you will, to this, to this final generation. And yeah, this is not scripted at all. And I love that because uh, the Holy ghost gets to take over and he gets all the credit anyways. But uh, guys, you can go to his website, but get all that information out here at the end. I'm going to let him do all of that. And uh, but there's I was reading over your bio. There's too much. There's so many similarities between your life and my life. It's it's kind of kind of, uh, you know, kind of cool. But uh, I just, again, appreciate what you've done and what you're doing. And so, uh, Jamie, I want to begin this by first of all, I'm going to just let you go wild and let you go loose uh, so that's that's dangerous, brother. Watch I know. out. <laughs> well, good thing is we're not uh, we don't have videotape, so this is gigabyte. So I think we can just keep yeah, going, right? right? <laughs> so the, the deal is, uh, yeah, the deal is, you know, to me, and see, here we are, just being natural, and that's what I like about this. It's not thou is brotherest, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, I don't play that game very well with people. So <laughs> no, I, it, it irritates me to the maximum. But basically. Uh, you know, we want to talk about being combat ready, you know, combat ready, not with, you know, obviously natural arms or these things uh, other than self-protection and things we do need. But uh, talking about the Christian life, and I've been dealing with the past couple of years uh, here at Ignited, the core man, the inner man that Paul speaks about to build ourselves up, the fortitude, the courage, the power, the boldness, these things. That, that comes from living a life of being a disciple, which is a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. And I think, and I know, Jamie, and, and I want you to speak on to this, that you know we're going to need that fortitude in the coming days. We have to prep. We have to have skills. I get all that. But the inner man, because the Bible is very specific that men's hearts will fail them because of fear for what they're going to see coming upon the face of the earth— and one of my jobs as a pastor, shepherd, leader, whatever you want to call me, is I don't want to see anybody shipwrecked. I don't want to see the the weak lost, and I don't want to see the feeble destroyed. I, I want to be a helper. And so I think the only way to do that really is by building that inner man. So my introduction and my asking of the question is, what do we do? to be combat ready, to be ready for these things that are just going to blow us away in the coming days. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a loaded question, but that is the question not even just of our generation, but of every church age that's preceded the ascension of Jesus Christ. And it was actually the foundational attributes that God was seeking to uh, engender and ingrain and call to remembrance in the Israelites through Abraham and onward and all the other different things going on from Genesis to Revelation. Even uh, before I jumped on the air, I'm working on my sermon for Sunday and specifically talking about spiritual dementia is what I'm going to be talking about on <laughs> Sunday. And and the, and how often, how oft to sound super cool, uh, the scripture yeah. calls us to, uh, to remembrance and it's remembrance uh, uh, incessantly called the remembrance of who God is, what he's done, who we are to God, who he is in us, who we are in Christ Jesus, and the hope that we now have an assurance of through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the reoccupied uh, seat at the right hand, what his mission set is, what the Father's mission set is, and therefore what our mission set is. And it's all this constant call, remember, 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 one singular thing, your identity in Christ. That's right. the constant clarion call, even all the vestments and all the activities of uh, the temple periods and the, the Old Testament edicts through uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy and elsewhere, all the Levitical laws was so that when Christ came, they would know and attest to what their identity was in Christ through God's sovereignty by grace. It's what the angels long to look into. It's what the prophets long to look into. It's what everybody's looking through a glass dimly. And then as the scriptures say, this now is the mystery that has been past tense made known to you, Christ Jesus. It's, it's the hope of glory, Christ in you. That was the centrality of everything that Emmanuel, hello, Emmanuel in the garden, then it was Emmanuel in the desert, till it, uh, and then, then it was Emmanuel in Israel till Ichabod was written over their heads. Then it's Emmanuel with us at the first coming of Jesus Christ for the assurance, the certainty of Emmanuel, God with us for all of eternity, Revelation 19 and 20 and 21, that, there, that God will dwell among them and never will they depart from his presence. Finally, the restoration of Emmanuel. That's what it's always been about. And so the only way to uh, just navigate this hostile territory under that reality is through this combat effectualness, this, uh, this uh, martial connotation that we now have in Christ Jesus. And every single detail of the sufficiency of the spirit that has been entrusted to us is so that we will be combat ready on the day of great testing. As it says in Hebrews 10, we're not of those who shrink back, knowing right. that if we do, he'll be displeased with us. Hello, like you, there is no cowardice allowed on the field of battle in this cosmic warfare against the glory of God through the sons of men. I mean, that's why cowards are the first ones dealt with in the lake of fire. It's the cowards. Singularly, the cowards are the first ones dealt with in the lake of fire because a coward at its core is an anathema to the warrior culture that God has established. And what's at the root of a warrior culture? What's at the war? What's at the root of combat readiness in Christ Jesus is a mutually assured degree of selfless sacrifice that you do not love your life so much as you're afraid to lose it. This is how we overcome all y'all powers of darkness, antichrist, B system, and our own flesh that's at war, enmity, bitter rancor, forcible hatred, warfare within us against the spirit of God is that we overcome it by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and we do not love our lives so much as we're afraid to lose it because it's a cosmic battlefield that we have been enlisted into by God's grace. So that's why when I look at Paul, in his letter to Philippians in Philippians 1, and I'm like, how is this not day one Christianity? Hey, right. welcome to the faith, gents. Like, <laughs> stand up, as it says, gird up your loins, which means testicular fortitude. Like, right. get some testicular fortitude, gird up your loins. I'm about ready to dress you down like a man, as God yep. says to Job and he says to Jeremiah. And he's like, listen up, gents, here's the deal. You better count the cost. Count the cost. 
because the savagery of this battlefield is so gnarly and cosmic and eternally consequential that only those whose hearts are completely sold out to me are going to stand the test of time. Uh, on This is the man who I esteem, him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. Anyone who loves the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Anybody, blah, 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 they're at enmity with God. And he goes on and on mm-hmm. and on and on and on. No greater love is there than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. That is a battlefield axiom coined by the true and better warrior, Jesus Christ, the soon coming conquering king. So I digress. Philippians 1. Right. The apostle Paul says this, I'm like, why, why isn't this what I was told when I came into the faith, I got saved in a secret friendly church, praise God. Somehow he works in spite of the wolves in sheep clothing. (laughs) But, uh, and, and, but I started devouring the word and I'm going, why isn't, why aren't they talking about this? Why isn't anybody preaching about this? And then I got, Hey brother, out of every church from there on out, because they're like, your zeal from the Lord is ridiculous. It makes everybody else feel insecure about their, their walk with the Lord. You need to leave anyways, (laughs) Philippians one, right? He says, I eagerly expect and hope I have an expectation that now as always, I will have sufficient courage. Why? So that Christ will be exalted in me, whether by life or by death. And then he goes on a little bit further and he says, so do not be frightened in any way by those who oppose you, gents. It'll be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you're going to be saved. And he he just he keeps going on and on and on through all this martial language, even with his disciples, even when he was operating out from his posture as Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant, he was laying the groundwork for his warrior class citizenry of the kingdom of heaven for when they would see him next as Messiah ben David, the conquering king, the line of the tribe of Judah, who rides out in justice and judgment to make war. He was like, he set the tone right from the get go. My kingdom suffers violence, ladies and gents. Only the violent can lay hold of it by force. You have to have an equal to greater measure. You have to be more than a conqueror, not to thrust others out of the way of my kingdom, but to literally thrust yourself into it because that's the nature of the warfare. And the only way that you can do that is if you are already a dead man walking on a field of battle that you don't understand. You must die first. And have no concept of self so that you are fearless in my love. You're fearless in a life hidden in me alone that you know that not a hair on your head can be touched and that the command has gone out. Touch not my anointed ones. Do them no harm that you have a knowing that he is more than able to make you stand before his presence blameless and with great joy that you would know. First Peter one, that by his power, you are being guarded to your inheritance that's being kept in heaven for you, spotless, unspoiled, unfading, being guarded by his power to it, that you would stand so resilient, so radiant, so steadfast, and such an eager anticipation of courage that nothing by any means would put you on your heels. That's what that's what Psalm 112 is all about, right? Like, right. blessed are those who fear the Lord, who take great delight in his commands. Their children be mighty in the land, right? And it goes on, says some stuff about being generous and what and what our attributes are. But then it says, we are not shaken. We have no fear of bad news. Our hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Our hearts are secure. We have no fear. Why do we have no fear? Because we're not, we're not scared of losing ourselves. We already did. It's done like we already done did it for proper English (laughs) students out there. Right. We we already done did it. And like I and and that's what Paul says. He's like, what? I'm a dead man walking, bro. Like, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to take my life from me. Sorry. Go ask my king bought and paid for ransom by his imperishable, incorruptible, eternal, precious blood. You have no say death. You have no sting, homie. Where are you at? You've been swallowed up. And so there is this brazenness. Mm -hmm. There is this, I say, an invincibility complex, not arrogancy or hubris or vanity, but it is a confidence. As Paul says, I am confident of this. I'm confident of this. I will boast. That is not pride. Well, it's a rightly placed pride. It's an authentic heavenly pride. I will boast in Jesus Christ. And him crucified 
I'm good to go. And so this is a part of that combat readiness that most people aren't aware of. They think it's about eschatology. They think it's about latest, greatest intel. They think about naming it, claim it, blab it, and grab it. They think it's about their special giftings of speaking in tongues, which most of them are totally demonic in the first place. They think it's about their 1611 King James only translation or the shape (laughs) of the earth. They think it's about everything else except for an identity in Christ. But as you know, <laughs> Brother Fairclaw, is that we have been assured in Daniel eleven thirty two, 32, the only ones mm. who are going to stand the test of time are the, those who know their God. Yeah. And they will be strong and they will go forth and do daring feats of valor as it's rendered in the original translation. That it, it has, yeah. it's not annoying of all these other things. It's not even annoying of their past. It's not annoying of their failings. It's not annoying of how many times they're fighting against their flesh and their flesh wins out. It's not annoying of their woundings and their childhood sex abuse. It's not, it's not annoying of all these other things. It's not annoying of their neo Gnostic knowledge and their super duper specialness because all they do is listen to podcasts all day long. It's annoying of their God. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's what makes them strong. <laughs> and he allows them to cooperate as a tier one operator, a co-operator with his son and with his spirit, with the heavenly host to the tearing down of the strongholds, the setting of the enemy prisoners of war free, the battlefield first aid applied to the binding up of the brokenhearted and to our great joy and his great glory, to the glory of the king. That's like those who know their God will be strong and go forth and do daring feats of valor. And so this battle readiness, and I actually, I think I, I think I preached a sermon on it six or nine months ago, literally called combat ready or something like that. Wow. Like actually that was the title of the sermon was combat readiness. Wow. And was talking specifically how the only way to be combat ready is to have to be utterly undone by the gospel of Jesus Christ to where there's none of you left. And, and then it's all by all the sufficiency of Christ. He says he's given us all spiritual blessings. He's said he's given us all we need for a life and godliness. He said he's given us all power to trample upon all the powers of darkness. I mean, look at the, look at the declarative statements over there. There's finality in all this language 24 seven, all throughout the scriptures. It is definitive, all encompassing and movable promises in Christ on what we have. Unfortunately, Most people have been made liable to destruction on a field of battle that they don't understand. Sin of Achan, right? Joshua 7. You have been made liable for destruction on the field of battle. You cannot stand before your enemies until you remove the devoted things that you've squirreled away in your camp that you think the spirit of the Lord, the living God does not see or know of. And all this carnal flesh, self-preservation, self-justification, self-righteousing, self-glorifying, self-everything, love of self, love of pleasure rather than love of God, having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof, stuff, you have been made liable for destruction on a field of battle you don't understand. So combat readiness looks like Joshua calling them out by tribe and then by clan and then by family. And it's each one man by man and dressing them down unto repentance to restore them in the right image and the right identity and the right sufficiency and free flow of the spirit and the power of God so that they could go take the land that God had already told him he was delivering into them. That's what it's all about. Brother Faircloth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm fired up just listening to you, brother. It blesses me so much because this is exactly the boot camp that the church needs to get back into, or actually even get into, because you have so many Pastor Aikens out there that haven't done their job. You know, they're they're more worried about the Hollywood lifestyle and all the things that they do, their money, their lasciviousness, these things, and they're just they're they're bleeding, they're they're raping, they're uh, destroying the God's heritage. You know, by by number one, not preaching truth, and number two, not living the example of Jesus Christ. So you're taking us to boot camp, and I love it because it's exactly what we must be doing. We must get back to the place of that identity. As you said, you hit it right on the money, right on the target. I've been preaching about fearless faith. Uh, I love that title. I love that analogy of fearless faith. I am a dead man. My life is default. 
And when we recognize and realize that, man, we can go into the front lines uh, without a care or concern whatsoever. Absolutely. So I want you to and stay. What, and what most people don't realize, Pastor Faircloth, is yeah. that that fear is the occurrency of all the belligerents in this cosmic war that's been raging right. since Genesis 1-1, when the world was tohu and bohu without form and void, and the Lord stood over the Leviathan, right? Mm-hmm. Over the chaos, the mm-hmm. chaos dragon. And fear is the currency of all belligerents to the powers of darkness and to the kingdom of light. And that's why God gives this command 365 times, <laughs> one one time for every day of our Gregor, Gregorian calendar is right. do not fear, do yeah. not be dismayed, do not be discouraged. He's constantly saying the same thing. Yet in juxtaposition, he says, bro, you better fear me. Daughter, yeah. you better fear me and fear me alone because he understands the power of fear on the field of battle. He understands the physiological effects. He understands the neurological and mental effects. He understands the effects on his heart. He knows that when you have a fear response, you go into auditory exclusion and you don't listen to anything other than the object of your fear. This is, I've been in combat. I took Baghdad in 03, like I understand. He knows that when you're under a fear response that your your eyes literally uh, dilate, your pupils dilate, yep. and you get fixated on the object of your fear to where you get tunnel vision on the object of your fear, and that becomes the only thing in your sphere of influence. He understands that physiologically with this fear response is that your body vasoconstricts and shunts all your blood to your core so that your heart can beat faster and harder in response to the object of your fear. And he knows that fear compels you to do one or two things, to either fight or to run in flight. It's going to do one or two things. And so that's why he says, you fear me and you and me alone. My God is a jealous God, a consuming God. He is so jealous that he, he's even jealous for our fear itself. And he says, you do not give it to anybody or anything else, seen or unseen, terrestrial or heavenly, nothing in all creation do you give your fear to but me. It belongs to me and me alone because I understand the power of it. But let me assure you of this, my perfect love will cast out all those other counterfeit fears. So that you don't have to fear those things because you understand my love that has been past tense made known to you in Christ Jesus. And it's not the spirit I've given you a fear of those things. I've given you a spirit for me and me alone. I've given you a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind, not of fear and not of timidity and not of worry and not of anxiety and not of woe is me and not self-deprecation and self-condemnation, not self-preservation, but such a steadfast fixation on the sufficiency of Christ in all things that you would have, as you just said, brother, a fearless faith, completely unrestrained, no conditions, blind, deaf, dumb, weak, trembling needs, shaky hands, trembling voice out of the wine press onto the field of battle because your God has called you to it. That's what he's called us to brother. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It's to storm the gates of hell. And this is what I want everybody to understand. We're, we're, we're not, you know, uh, conjuring up things and, and emotions uh, to go out and storm, you know, this or storm that. It's to storm the gates of hell, to bring people into salvation, to be strong in the power of his might in these final days, to help the weak, to help the feeble, to help the elderly, to help the uh, the sick, the afflicted. On and on it goes. Those are the mourning. Those are the weeping. That's why you're strong. That's why I'm strong. That's why our ministries are strong in the Lord. Of course, it's his strength completely. But we're, 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 we're getting this baptism, if you will, of Holy Ghost power, strength and fire and might of these last days, not so that we can shine brighter, look better on YouTube or whatever media platform we're on. It's so that we can go into the dark places. We can go in there again, with that fearless faith and say, you know what? I'm not afraid of you, pedophilia. I'm not afraid of you, uh, murderers and seditions and all all these different things that are out there and say, you know what? We're here to bring life and light. We're here to bring truth and power and to see the captive set free. That's my whole mission of life is is to, to be a rescuer, to help those that can't help themselves. So you're just firing us up, brother. And uh, the sun, everybody better watch out for Sunday. That's all I know, because Sunday, 
<laughs> well, it's, it's even interesting that you just said that about rescue. I mean, that's two weeks ago. That was my sermon was, uh, oh, uh, wow. search and rescue operations of the Lord was the SAR wow. operations of the Lord. And again, I, I keep telling like everything about the gospel is martial. Every yes. single aspect of the gospel can only be understood through a mar- our martial connotation. And yep. even Christ was having a difficult time getting that through to his apostles. Yep. He's like, listen, gents, I, you, you got me all wrong. You think I came to bring peace. You're not understanding my mission set. Mm-hmm. I came to make war. I came to bring a sword. I came to divide. Whenever somebody says, Ooh, I don't want to be divisive. I'm like, then you don't know your God. My God right. is all about divisions, yeah. but right divisions by his spirit and by his word and in righteousness and humility. He's all about divisions, you know, and Jesus, at first John three, eight, the son of man was made manifest for this reason, Pastor Faircloth, to make you feel really special about yourself. <laughs> Wrong. No. <laughs> it says the son of man was made manifest for this reason, that he yeah. might destroy the works of the evil one. Right. We can look at his commission, his militaristic warning order commission in Isaiah 41 and elsewhere about what he was commissioned to do. And it was come. He was on a search and destroy mission set from his father yeah. to, to break out the enemy prisoners of war, to set the captives free, to bind up, bind up the brokenhearted, to strike a blow against the enemy and to proclaim the day of the Lord's vengeance. Like people forget that part of the verse. They like <laughs> only the fluffy stuff, right? And it's like, this is what they're all about. I mean, Jesus literally said about every place where he placed his foot was a battlefield tactic of asymmetric warfare against everything the powers of darkness had done. There's a reason why he was crucified at Golgotha or Calvary, as most people render it, the place of the skull, the place of what skull? The skull, the Nephilimic freak shows that had been making war against him and humanity from the onset. There's a reason why Christ and and, uh, Caesarea Philippi said, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will will not prevail against it. He wasn't talking about Peter himself. He was talking about Mount Hermon in the background behind him, which shadow he was in saying, I am here to re to not reclaim. I never lost it, but to declare the victory, my consummate victory as a cosmic battlefield commander once and for all time. So much so in the ultimate tactical asymmetric warfare, hybrid warfare maneuver, faint maneuver and tactical decapitation. They did not know because of his operational security, what they were doing, that their crucifixion of Christ was actually a part of his plan, the definite foreknowledge of God, as the scripture went, renders it, so that Christ could take the fight to the enemy HQ and Sheol and snatch back up the keys of death in the grave and then preach to them, I win, you lose, and then have the power to take his own life back up again. Like, this is the God that I serve. So when I came into the faith, I'm like, just reading the Bible, like, why isn't anybody telling me this? Why is anybody like, it just made sense to me from the onset. Maybe it's, you know, coming out of the Marine Corps and I was in law enforcement, fire EMS. Like I understood what I was reading as I read it because I understand warrior cultures and warrior cultures fight and they die and they bleed and they suffer and they train so that others might live. They do it from a higher form of love that people in the secular world, in the natural world, in the business corporate world will never understand what authentic leadership looks like from a warrior's perspective. It is selfless sacrifice to the death, even for people that don't give a crap about you back in the homeland who are not even thinking about what you're doing out there. And you do it all for the highest form of love that could ever be expressed. You know, I think it was Corey Ten Boom who coined the phrase that love will always manifest itself to the degree to which it's willing to sacrifice towards the object of its love. Let me say that again. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Love will always manifest itself to the degree to which it's willing to sacrifice itself for the object of its love, Christ Jesus the true and better warrior king leading from the front. And so then it's like, so when I know his mission set, then I know and understand my mission set. When I understand God, the father's mission set, he says, son, go. And the son's like, aye, aye, sir, I'll go. 
And they're like, son, go. And this is what you're going to do. You are going to make war against the enemies of our throne and of our kingdom who rebelled even before humanity was created. And then you are going to restore them. And we're going to testify to our consummate victory because by faith, having not seen us, they'll believe us and it will be accredited to them as righteousness. They saw us in full. They knew us in full and they rejected us. Watch this act of warfare against them. And that's what it's been about ever since. And we're approaching the time in our generation and this pathetic, disgusting, hot vomit, swallowing latency in church age yeah. where it's all coming into its convergent zenith. And the Lord has said that his eyes are ranging throughout the whole of the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He's <laughs> yes. got a mission set in this generation for those with ears to hear, let them hear what the spirit is saying to the church. I mean, first Samuel 10 talks about the valiant men, the men of valor whose yeah. hearts the Lord had touched. He's always talking about this is who my people are. Cause they represent me. Cause that's who we are. We, the Trinity, we, the heavenly, like that's what we do. And that's why he says, woe to the complacent, woe to the apathetic, woe to the latest see in church that's either hot nor cold, woe to those lovers of self, woe to those lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, woe to those who are always learning but never coming to understand the truth, and woe to those who love their lives so much so that they are afraid to lose it for his name's sake. Woe. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I'm listening to. I'm trying not to preach, man. This is <laughs> this this is this is up my alley. This is exactly what I love because I'm listening to you, brother, and I'm I'm thinking about where in the world did the church go wrong with this, you know, pastor pantyhose, milk toast Christianity that we have out there? This Joel Osteen, you know, we're all worried about finances and your best life now, and on and on it goes. You know, th this is exactly the way the Bible is displayed and displays Christ, displays God. The Bible declares that the Lord is a warrior, but we've lost that. We've lost that. We're more worried about self-preservation, our own stuff, our own denominations, whatever we're caught up in, rather than becoming that that warrior warrior worshiper, you know, like King David. I love King yes. David. Yes, worshiping of my warriors. Amen. Yeah, that's my favorite. It, so tell me, brother, how do we... First of all, we need this message everywhere. And those that are watching right now, share this link everywhere. Put it on the bathroom wall somewhere at a truck stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Get it out because we've got to go back to boot camp. We've got to go back to and This is all in love. I mean, I'm not saying get up there in the pulpit and just whip everybody, have a flogging uh, at the altar. But bringing the power of the gospel back to reality of the first church, authentic Christianity, uh, that, that's what I preach. That's what I believe. The first church to get back to that relationship with God, to be that disciple again, the discipline follower of Jesus Christ. But you're going to have to have this kind of leadership, Jamie. You got to have this kind of pastoral leadership. These shepherds. Uh, how do we get there? You know, I know it's got to be God. We got to have an outpouring. There's no doubt about it. Um, but but how do we get there from your perspective, your view, and from your platform? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question and how we get there, you know, and 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 just to to add a caveat, you know, like you were saying, it's not about getting up in the pulpit and and dressing people down, although there's a time and a place for it. But it's right. never for a ruination. It's only ever for a reformation. See, Always. what religion does is call out, but what the gospel does is call up. Absolutely. And so that's that's the unique qualifier of authentic uh, godly leadership is calling people up in to their identity in Christ. It's calling them to remembrance as we were talking about earlier. It's like, it's like, this is who you are. Act like it. This is the family name that you now bear. You're falling short of the family name, arise to the challenge and live up to the family name. Look at the ring on your finger, feel the weight of the cloak on your back. Remember your family name and act like it. When that's what you read the apostle Paul doing is like, Hey, listen, I got these things against you. This is what's going on. Hey, bro, stop sleeping with your mom or what? You know, it's like, think of all the yeah. <laughs> like, think yeah. of like what a pastor, you know, what a pastor has to deal with on a weekly basis. You're like, seriously, are we seriously having to have this conversation? But then you go, okay, listen, 
I want to expose the deceit of what's going on in your mind right now. And I'm going to remind you of who you are in to God through Christ Jesus. This is who you are, period. I don't care if you feel like it. I don't care if it resonates with you. I don't care if your circumstances are deceiving you to where you can't even receive it. Like when Moses brought word to the Israelites, it says they could not hear what he said because of their cruel bondage and their downcast spirit. They couldn't hear him. Nice. And it's like, so I don't care if you feel it. This is who you are, period, because this is who Christ is in you. See, in the second you get people to stop fixating on themselves and actually live out from Christ in them, then, then there's freedom. Then there's radiancy. Then there's steadfastness and resoluteness. Then there's boldness. Then there's endurance and perseverance, which is required to make us mature and complete, lacking nothing in Christ Jesus. And so the reality is, is when you think about and, and it, did I hear you right, brother? You were in the army? Yes. Army National Guard. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So you understand the process of what does it take to make a warrior? Mm -hmm. You have to deconstruct their identity and then build them back up in the right identity. That's the only way you shave their heads. You put them in line. You make them all look the same. You remove all their little individualism, all their little self stuff, all their family of origin. I don't care about your cry baby, you know, socioeconomics <laughs> of what you came from. I don't care about this. I don't care about your color. I don't care about your creed. I don't care about your nationality. You strip them all down to the basic common denominator and you remove all their former identity, every single detail of their identity, yeah. and then you crush them and you crush them and you crush it out of them for the first three quarters of boot camp. And then what happens? Once the crushing <laughs> is done, yeah. once the Gethsemane is done, the place of the crushing, once yep. you've been through Gethsemane, then they start restoring you and building you into an identity as a warrior, they start speaking over you heritage, legacy, the heroes that have gone before you, your yeah. ethos, your codes of conduct, the expectations of this culture that you have now been uh, privileged, privilege, not granted, but privileged to be a part of. They yeah. tell you about all that have gone before you, all the sacrifices that have been made for you to be doing what you're doing right now. And they start speaking these things over you and building you up in your identity so that if you allow it to have its work, if you allow the discipline and the training right. and the perseverance and the endurance, it let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You have to let the perseverance have its way that then at the appointed time, as Habakkuk says, though it lingers, wait for it. It will come and not delay. It will yeah. not prove false. Do not grow weary in doing good for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. If you do not give up at the appointed time, you will understand your identity and it will never leave you. You will know that you're a warrior. That's why Marines are unique, even in the natural that we say once a Marine, always a Marine. Right. Why? Because of the tearing down and the identity that they build you back up in. That's that's, that's why when I read the gospel as a Marine, I'm like, oh my goodness, I know what I'm reading, you know? And I see the esprit de corps and I see the, yeah. the unity of mission set and I see the selfless sacrifice and I see the, the death and the persecution and, and the struggle and the triumph and the conquering and the victories and the, and the battlefield axioms and the tactics being employed and the, and the direct action missions to deliver people from enemy prisoner camps. Like, when I read the gospel, I knew exactly what I was looking at because I'd recently gotten out of the Marine Corps. And so that's what it looks like to be made battle ready. It's an identity in Christ alone. I mean, brother, that's the entire premise of my book. Uh, not saying anybody needs to read it. I, I read it regularly because it's literally just the word. I don't know. There's like 300 scriptures in it. It's just a word. And the whole premise of the book is Omega Dynamics equipping a warrior class of Christians for the days ahead. What are our Omega Dynamics? Our powerful and effectual actions at the end of all things, our Omega Dynamics. Yeah. And even the book systematically goes through tearing down faulty identities, 
even of who God is, who Christ is, what love is, who we are, what the missions are, what the purpose of the church is. It's a deconstruction to the lowest common denominator to build us back up in the singularity of our identity in Christ. And the singularity of our identity is as warriors in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Exodus 15, 3. The Lord is, a, or 15, 13, I can't remember. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name, period. That's right. The Lord, like a mighty man of war, will stir up his zeal and show, him, show himself mighty against his foes. The, mm-hmm. Lord, he, the Lord goes out like a dread warrior. Think right. of that. Right. And God is love, period. So mm-hmm. how God is a warrior, period. These are short declarative statements about who he is in the scriptures. They tell you exactly who he is. God is a warrior, God is love. How, how could this be possible? Because warriors only do what they do because of authentic love. Notice it says he's a warrior, not a soldier. Right. He's a, it's a, di- it's a very difference. definitive distinction. Not all people who serve in the military are warriors. Not right. all people who carry a, a firearm in combat are warriors. A warrior is a spirit. It is a yes. particular anointing and gifting of the spirit to be a warrior. It is not a begrudging conscript. It's right. not a guy looking for free college money. It's right. not a whatever that didn't have any other choices. It is an indwelt, inane hyper blessed gifting a touch of the heart to be a warrior because warriors love harder than anybody I've ever met in my life. That's why they sacrifice and that's why they fight and that's why they're willing to die. So that's why the Lord is a warrior and the Lord is love could never be separated. Warriors do what they do because of love and somebody who's filled with authentic love actually fights. Because they love. And so that's why God is the true and better warrior. Yeah, 100 percent. And that's exactly what we need, a baptism of that love, the baptism of that warrior spirit. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in us, it quickens us, makes us alive. And, uh, you know, some I, I got like a thousand sermons already going off of my head. It's like the synapses, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, 99% of the churches, this is a foreign message. If you stood at 99% of the churches today, they would look at you like an alien. Uh, I, I have, I have been invited to speak at mega churches, yeah. which I'm like, you obviously don't listen to me. <laughs> no. Um, you know, the, these churches with five, seven, 10, 15,000 congregations. Yeah. And I will tell you this, they're one and done invitations. They're one and done because they don't want to hear this. And you want to know why? Because yeah. they would have to die to self that's and right. see, that's the qualifier that the mod, that 90, I'd say 98.7% of Christians do not right. want to do 98.7%. No. They do not want anything that's going to infringe on their comfort and their love of pleasure. Remember, they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So that means that pleasure, their pleasure response and their sense of self, they'll be lovers of self, proud, boastful, arrogant, treacherous, rash, conceited, you know, all these things. Remember, that's not talking about the unbelieving world. He said, this is what you can expect to see in the church in the last (laughs) days. And he was saying, this is what the church is going to look like. They're always being learning, but never coming to an understanding of truth. They'll be filled with mockers and scoffers. They will not tolerate sound doctrine. Doctrine. They will give heed to the seductions and the doctrines of demons, like, yeah. like, and the and the pastors will deceive them, and then they'll be deceived. And the shepherds will feed on the sins of the people because they love pleasure, and the people love pleasure, and the pastors love the world, and the people love the things of the world. And now all my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea, like yeah. all of them are, they have no concept of what's going on. And it's all because of their re- total repudiation and rejection of what it looks like to die to self for the Lord. They don't want to die to self. They love themselves. In fact, every positive, encouraging, vomit in my mouth Caleb song is about how special you are. <laughs> and what Christians don't understand is it's never been about you. Right. It has never been about, it says, so that they would see me and know me and glorify my father. And the father says, no, so that you would see my son and glorify him. And he's like, no, so that they'll glorify you, father. And they're like, no, so they'll glorify you, son. He's like, I want them to be where, where I am so they will yeah. see my glory. And then they'll see you and glorify you. And they're like, no, bro, no, I want them to glorify you. And it's this glory yeah. fest in the heavens. And somehow we've made it about us. 
Yeah. It was never about us. We are beneficiaries of a love fest between the father and son. But here's what's so radical about it. It says, and I want them to know the same love you've had for me, father. I want them to know that too. Oh my goodness. I'm like, who is this God that we serve? And yet we have this Pollyanna, pacifist, panty waist, effeminate, lispy, American church that is so <laughs> disgusting, it makes my skin crawl. And yeah. that's why the Lord says, listen, those with the ears to hear, let them hear. Go yeah. ahead, Nicolaitans. Go do your love of the world thing. Keep compromise. Go ahead, Jezebels. Go do yeah. your thing, Jezzies. You know, yeah. whatever you want to do. Go ahead, Balaam's there. Go run after it. Whatever, you know. Go ahead and be compromised. You say you're wealthy and need nothing. I'm telling you. You have very high faulty self-actualization, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you this as well too. Those with ears to hear, let them hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Listen to those who overcome, to those who conquer, this is what I have for you. To those who overcome, to those who conquer, this is what I have for you. And he keeps going down the line of what he has in store for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Not those who like fire insurance and not those who... Yeah. really, really, really appreciate Jesus and they appreciate moralism and they appreciate, that's not what it says. That's not what, what God distinguishes. Malachi 3, 16 through 4, 3 says exactly what he's going to do. At that time, yeah. a scroll was written in his presence concerning those who feared him and who yes. revered him. And he says, those are the ones I'm listening. I'm paying attention. My eyes search throughout the whole of the earth. I am listening to everything. And I have scrolls being written in my presence concerning those who fear me and who revere my name. He says, they will make up my treasured possession. And finally, again, I'm going to make and show and declare the distinction between those who serve me and those who do not. And he said, those are the ones that are going to go out like calves released from a stall. Those are the ones that are going to see righteousness with healing in the wings. Those are the ones that are going to have the spirit of light in the last day. And those are the ones that are going to see the enemies of my kingdom, the ashes under the soles of their feet. Malachi four. Like it's so yep. definitive. Sorry. I just, I'm always like, I'm always just in awe of the word because I don't have to wonder, I don't have to guess, I don't have to perplex, and I don't have to consternate. I still may lean into that because the because my heart and flesh fail me, sure. but the Lord is the God of my heart. I, I may lean into that because I'm double-minded and and you know have carnalities that rear up and bends and biases and get deceived and you know get kicked around by the enemy at times. But the word is so definitive, so that as I call it to remembrance. My heart is secured, trusting in the Lord. My heart is steadfast. I have no fear. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was thinking as, as you were you were speaking uh, of those that that uh, there's so many people listening right now, uh, Jamie. That, that ha they they're thinking to themselves, "How do I measure up to this?" I mean, I'm listening to this guy. I mean, he's he's laying it out. He's got it together. You know, as far as the scriptures concerned. Uh, he, he understands it. He sees it. But man, I feel so far below that bar. I feel so inadequate. Uh, either I have a pastor that's a, you know, spineless Laguini or they're just, you know, whatever, been abused by the church, the whole nine yards. You know the stories. You know, what What do we say to those folks? What, do, what What's your prescription, I guess, for them to say, you know, this does apply to you. It's not the slick haired, shiny shoe specialist guy out there. This Absolutely. is what... Yeah, this is what God has given to all of us. I, I go back to the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. He's in me. He's in you. Uh, so so br bring us to that point, that that person that's listening, that, again, feels under the bar, can't get there. This is just too much. How do you bring him there? Well, it's, uh, that's a perfect question. And I, and people don't like it, but it's, it is, a true and trustworthy saying is I can assure you, you are that inadequate. So I always say you actually are that inadequate. You are that double minded. You are that sinful. You are that wayward. You have no righteousness of your own. There's no justification that you can bring before a holy God. You are weak and you are pathetic. Oh, Jacob, you worm. 
Oh, yeah. little Israel, you are an appendageless worm eating in the dust that I can't tell your butt from your face. I mean, right. that's what yeah. God lays out like that. So, so listen, he, it's actually a term of endearment that God was speaking over Jacob sure. and Israel in Isaiah 41 when he said that. But look at all the qualifiers before that, all the I wills of the Lord. And by the way, all these I wills are a repudiation of the I wills of the pride of the flesh of Lucifer. Right. Everything's a tit for tat in that warfare. He says, I will take you by your right hand. I will say, this is the way walking in. I will be your shield. I will be your very great reward. You will hear my voice telling you, I will take you. Do not fear. I do it all. And then, and then Christ comes along and is the affirmation of it. None of your works, none of your sacrifices, none of your fat, none of your holidays, none of your feast days, none of your, your record keeping and, and calendar keeping stuff. None of it. You bring nothing to the table other than your depravity and the failings of your flesh every day. You are that bad. And I love you. I love right. you. Yeah. Don't you understand? Yeah. I, and you're the object of my every waking thought. And I, they're more numerous than the sands on the sea. And I, I'm thinking about you constantly. And I thought about you before you were in the womb, before the foundations of the earth. And then I thought about you when you're in the womb. And I'm thinking about you all the time. And my grace is sufficient. My power works backs in weakness. My righteousness is your covering. You have none of your own. My faithfulness is your shield and buckler. You will never be able to be faithful to me. I'll be faithful to you. I will guard you to re your reward to your inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, spotless, unspoiled, and fading. I'll get you to it by your power. I will make you stand in my presence, blameless and with great joy. I am more than able. He says it all the time. I am able. So to the listener, I say, come to the realization of how pathetically inadequate you actually are. So that you can finally wash his feet with your hair and tears. Yeah. So that you could actually understand why you're breaking the neck off of your alabaster jar. Yeah. And with undone by the gospel, knowing, oh, the woman of the city, well-known woman of renown of sin in the city. And she goes, I know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And with undone joy, I can, all my sin that I'd stored up was, is contained within that alabaster jar. All your lawlessness, all your licentiousness, all your perversities, all your sexual immoralities, all your insecurities, all your fears, all your woundings, all your abuse, all your sex abuse, all your childhood, all your failings of life are contained within the jar. That is the wages of your life. And that is what is the finally the most pleasing, amazing aroma to your king is to break that open because that's all you have to bring and pour it on his feet. And with undone joy, not sobbing and like, oh, I can't believe I get to be here in his presence, but undone joy. Yeah. You wash his feet with your hair and tears. And he goes, finally, yeah. finally, they get it that yeah. I came to wash their feet first. And unless that's I wash you, you can have no part of me. That's right. Oh, yeah. the gospel. That's I'm like, the God, how are we not undone by this? I don't get it, Pastor. I'm like, how are we not undone by this? I'm undone by it every day. I know exactly what I am. Yes. I know exactly, exactly what I am. I yeah. am a lawless rebel yep. apart from Christ in me. Apart from the, see, I now have no obligation to do what my sinful nature urges me to do. For if I live by its dictates, surely I will die. But if by the power of the spirit, I put to death the deeds of the spirit, the flesh, I will live. And I'm like, yeah, I am still that lawless. However, praise be to God. I now don't have an obligation to do what it's urging me to do. It's my sinful flesh is still urging me. Satan didn't go away just because I'm in Christ. My flesh That's didn't right. go away just because I'm in Christ. But now I'm not a slave to it. I'm right. not a slave again to fear. I'm not a slave again to sin. I'm not a slave again to this. I can actually make space, get out of the way for Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so that's the only way. The, on, the only way is to be well aware of your inadequacy so that you can be well aware of the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ in you. See, yeah. we'll come full circle. Those who know their God that's right. will be strong. 
Yeah. And they'll go forth and do exploits, not for themselves, not for vain glory, right. but for his glory. Yeah. And that that's how it all like wraps together in this perfectly amazing God magnifying Christocentric worldview that why you can actually rejoice in your sufferings. You can count it all up here. Joy. All these scriptures can only make sense in light of the fullness of the gospel, which means that it has nothing to do with you. It's about Christ in you. That brother is identity. Yes. Yeah. You know, those that know their God, that that's not knowing about him theologically. That's knowing him intimately. And, you know, again, my synapses are just firing off here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, so basically the solution is just total abandonment. That's what you're saying. Total abandonment. I must decrease so that he would increase. I got to be poured out so he would pour in. It's completely about him. That's where I find my identity is to lose myself. Uh, some of the things you were, when you were saying it, it reminded me of scars. We have scars in our lives to remind us of past pain. And so many times in religiosity and Christianity today, we try to get rid of the scars. I'm glad for my scars because they remind me, Jamie, of where I've been. I've been the hell and back. And it helps me recognize who I was and who I could be without him and realize that I need him to continue my journey. And that's part of the brokenness. I think we're always broken. We're never fixed. We're fixed when we get there. And the old, revi- yeah. the old yeah, the old revivalists used to say, and I don't mean that in a in a handicapped way of uh uh you know, I I you know, I'm, I'm I can't do what I need to do. It just I recognize that without him, I'm nothing. And I was thinking about the great revivalists. Uh, I love revivalists, the history of revival. They would say, bend me, Lord, bend me, you know, to, to be broken by the Holy Ghost, to be bent by the Holy Ghost. We don't do that today. We, we don't have no. that mentality because our pastors get up there and tell us how wonderful they are rather than showing their humility and their brokenness. So you have painted a phenomenal picture. You did bring us around uh, to where we needed to be. Uh, those that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Revelation 12, 11, you know, we're going to overcome this enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. But here's the part where they don't finish. The modern preachers don't finish this part, that they didn't love their lives to the death. Yep, exactly. And when you and when you look at it, Pastor Faircloth, is that if if we just go through the Beatitudes, right, the Sermon on the Mount. Right is that the modern church, because of the wolves in sheep's clothing that are narcissistic puppeteers in the pulpits, um, <laughs> they're predators. They're straight predators. They are. That we have, we have systematically forfeited every blessing of the Beatitudes. True. Willfully, deliberately. Just like it says, and I think it's 2 Peter 3, they deliberately forget that the same God who judged the earth with the deluge is coming again to judge it with fire. It's deliberate, willful choice. That's why they're delusional, not ignorant, delusional. And they're delusional because of their choices. They're delusional because it was willful, deliberate choice. Knowing God, they neither glorify him nor gave him thanks. So he gives them over because they loved not the truth. Not that they didn't know the truth. They just didn't love it. Yeah. He sends them a strong delusion, right? And so when you look at the beatitude, it's like, blessed are the poor in spirit. No, I'll never be poor in spirit, positive, encouraging, Caleb. You know, like, uh, <laughs> blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, yeah. blessed are you when you're when they persecute, revile you, and see all kinds of things. They like, yeah. we have systematically forfeited every single blessing yeah. in Christ because of the pride of the flesh, Laodicea in church, mystery Babylon, the Israelites in the days of uh, Mal- in Malachi 2, who weary the Lord by saying, I'll never see harm. I'll never see shame. Where is this God of justice? And all the prophets are just wind. I'll, I, I will have an abundant life on my terms and they will never be crushed. And what they don't understand is the only way for the oil to come from the lampstands to light the, the candles in the innermost courts is in Gethsemane itself, which right. Christ went through for your sake, is they the vacuoles on the olives had to be rushed to get the oil out that was used yes. for anointing and that yes. was used as a testimony of the power of the Spirit of God and that was used to burn bright, brightly. You couldn't press it. You couldn't cut it. You couldn't break it. It had to be 
crushed. crushed. Gethsemane is the place of the crushing where yeah. Christ was crushed for our transgressions to break loose the fullness of the Holy Spirit that now anoints us and allows us with unveiled faces to reflect the glory of the brightness of the image of God in this crooked and perverse generation. I Again, <laughs> there it the is. gospel. Why yeah. do we not understand the gospel? It's so freaking radical. I can't even wrap my mind around it. I never get exhausted talking about it. No, it no. is literally everything. And yet people are ho hum humdrum running through life or actually the worst. I think the worst posture is this Christian truther movement. They're say yeah. nothings and do nothings, but all they do is consume information 24 seven. They are the ones who will say, Lord, Lord, is this Christian yes. truther movement. They have no regard for the things of the Lord, but I bet they're all amped up listening to us talk right now. And yet they're like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and walks away and forgets what it looks like. They're hear the words, but not doers. They have faith, but no deeds. Their faith is dead. I didn't say that. That's what the Holy, you're the Holy one of Israel said. Right. And you know what? They're, the, now you're firing me up even more. I mean, this, this, this. This is exactly what the prominent voice of America is right now for the Christian church. They're speaking on our behalf. And like, you're not speaking for me. You're not no speaking way. for me as a pastor, brother, or as a believer. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna just chill. Uh, <laughs> this is your time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> listen, dude, we, we, could, we could be at this for, for another hour. I want to honor your time. It is our first time together. Next time, I'll just, you know, we'll, we'll just do it for however long. But. I, I want you to, to to pray with everybody uh, and, and and just, you know, whatever the Lord leads you to. And then I want you to share your ministry, what's going on, where to get a hold of you, that kind of. And I get kind of, to me, some of that stuff's corny, but I, I want them to get a hold of you and support you somehow. And we're going to do everything we can to get this, this out there in your ministry, you know, uh, even more of the message, because I believe in this message. This is the message of the hour. This message is not... Yeah, okay, in time. So, okay, I have to say something prophetic. Okay, so people will tune in, right? You know, uh, there's yeah. an eclipse coming. <laughs> I just did an interview with Michael Snyder about, okay, there you go. Uh, you know, that stuff doesn't really make a hill of beans of a difference. Right now, we got to keep people, number one, uh, you know, from losing their minds uh, in the church and what have you. And, and then again, becoming more like uh, Jesus, as you've been been so eloquently teaching and preaching. So having said that, please pray. And then let's take a minute or two and I'll have you uh, share your ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you that your name is even on our lips. I, I say it all the time, even to our little church body. I can't believe your name is on my lips. Um, so few, so few speak your name, God. And um, so few of my friends or my family members or people in my sphere of influence have your name on their lips. And so I'm just grateful for that, God, um, that while I was dead in my trespasses, you sought me in obsessive, relentless love. God pursued me to ignite my heart, to expose my sins, God, to lead me into repentance and then to restore me and stand me on my feet, God, and make my face radiant once more. And I'm just thankful, Lord. I'm thankful for your word and for your spirit, for your all sufficiency in all things, Jesus. And uh, God, I just pray against any way in which religion and the pride of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boasting and what he has and does of men reduces your sufficiency, whether it's by trying to have a righteousness of their own or to justify themselves before you, God, to to do their Torah thing or their flat earth thing or their whatever yes. thing that makes them think that yes. that's the only way to uh, be right before you. And they totally deny and reject the all sufficiency of your son, Jesus. I come against that spirit, Lord. And I pray God that you would solidify our identity in you and that you would uh, awaken our hearts, revive our eyes. God, refresh our souls as Ezra nine says, give us that space for grace 
to take a thorough examination of our hearts by your spirit, God, and know that uh, you test us and you discipline us and you expose us not for our harm, but for our good, that we would understand how merciful it is to be exposed for our fears and our insecurities and our prides and our lust and our apathy and our indifference, how merciful God to expose us now willingly rather than later on desperately. And I pray God that as you, as we become increasingly aware of your loving kindness, that we would allow ourselves to be undone so that we could be like, uh, just lift the hem of your garment and sleep at the feet of our true and better Boaz, our kinsman redeemer and you, Jesus Christ, and just rest at your feet and be secure in the shadow of your wings, God, and take refuge in your pinions and, and just rest in the, in your faithfulness that is our shield and our buckler and watch you, Jesus, as the arrow in the hand of your father, the warrior, a polished arrow, like it says, that is loose to strike a blow on our behalf and to uh, guard us home to our inheritance. So, Lord, just have your way in us. Make your people to be the kingdom of priests, of warrior priests that you've foreknown us to be. Set us apart like you've foreknown us to be set apart. God, and for all the naysayers and the haters and those who have made a deliberate choice to feed their flesh and live in their carnality and have no regard for your things, cut them off. Yeah. And I cut them off in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Yes. All yes. these tares and all these wolves and sheep clothing and, and all these go goats intermingling and confusing and confounding mm. and perplexing and usurping your authentic body who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, God. I just cut them off in the name of Jesus Christ because I know that those who do hunger and thirst for righteousness we will be satisfied yes. and never again will we hunger and we can purchase milk and water and food from you at no cost because of what you've done, Jesus. So I just thank you and praise you for this time with my brother, Lord, bless him, his ministry and his words, God, carry his voice to the ends of the earth, not for him, but to the magnification of your son, Jesus yes. Christ, Lord, in every way. So we just thank you, God. And I pray that you would have your way in my heart and in my home, God, that you would um, just expose me for all the fallacies of my carnality, because I know you're faithful and just, God, to heal me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Um, I am fearless, God, in being exposed and undone by you. I know your love is going to sustain me all the way home, and I have no condemnation now in Christ Jesus. We love you, Lord, and I pray all these things because of your son, Jesus, our Christ. Yes. Amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Uh, brother, I want you to go ahead and just, if you don't mind, uh, share just a little bit about your ministry. Give us some information. It'll be in the description box uh, when this is uh, uploaded. So tell us how to get yeah. over you. <laughs> sure thing. Yeah, people can get a hold of me at omegadynamics.org. That's omegadynamics.org. That's kind of a landing page. They can find the book Omega Dynamics, Equipping a Warrior Class of Christians for the Days Ahead on uh, on Amazon. Actually, Steve uh, was kind enough and very generous to write the forward to that book. Steve Quayle was. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and they can also find information about our camp here. I currently run a camp and uh, own and run a camp here in Colorado. And this is where our church is as well, too, outside Durango, Colorado. And we are hosting our fifth annual Warrior Summit, uh, mm -hmm. June 13th through the 14th. So it's a big camping weekend every year. There's about 300 plus people and campers nice. and RVs and bumper poles. And we have cabins and a lodge and shower houses and blah, 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 and RV hookups here mm -hmm. on the camp. And then uh, we spend time in worship every evening in an event venue right in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains on a lake uh, where the camp's at. And we uh, just have times of intentional fellowship and restoration. And our verse for this year actually is Ezra 9, 8, about uh, the Lord has given us a little space for grace. And uh, we want to magnify him in that and let him revive our hearts and refresh our eyes for a short time, because we all know what's coming next. I know you know, I've seen it. The Lord's told me, he's given me visions and dreams, the word informs it. And the machinations of the global elite are manifesting it every day. So uh, it's time to work while it is yet day because a night will come where no one will work. And we're called to redeem the time for the days are evil. Be wise, not unwise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. So uh, we'll awesome. be doing that out here uh, June 13th through the 
16th. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's going to be part of getting ready for the underground church, getting networking and all those things. So it's really exciting, man. That's totally awesome. Jamie, man, I'm thrilled. I'm blessed. I'm enriched. You know, some people you, you talk to and you get exhausted and then there's others you're just fired up. So, uh, uh, guys, I would tune, <laughs> I would tune into our broadcast for Sunday morning and check out Jamie for his Sunday morning. It's going to be awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, brother. I really appreciate you. Bless you. And we'll be, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much, brother, for having me on. You're welcome. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We love you. Remember, you don't have any troubles. All you need is faith in God. I love you.